for joining us here at the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston online worship service. I'm Carol Burris, and I'm grateful to serve as your Director of Religious Community. This morning, we are thrilled to welcome to our pulpit the Reverend Dr. Natalie Finnamore. She is on the ministerial team at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Shelter Rock in Manhasset, New York. She has been a parish minister, a minister of religious education, and a director of religious education in Maryland, Virginia, and New York. Dr. Finnamore is past president of the Liberal Religious Educators Association and is currently the vice president of the Star King School of Ministry Board of Trustees, as well as a member of the Unitarian Universalist Association Commission on Institutional Change. In this morning's sermon, Reverend Dr. Finnamore tells us of the meeting between John Murray and Thomas Potter on the shores of New Jersey in 1770. This encounter set John Murray on the road to founding the Universalist Church of America. She then asks, but what of the other man? What of Thomas Potter? She is joined this morning by First Church Assistant Minister of Congregational Life, Reverend D. Scott Cooper, our Business Administrator, Tawana Grice, Worship Associates, Joe Zuluski and Valerie Tolman, Music Director, Mark Vogel, who is joined this week by Charlie Burris on bass and guitar. Some of you may be new to this congregation, and I'd like to share just a little bit about Unitarian Universalism. It is a faith where you can bring your whole self, your full identity, your questioning mind, and your expansive heart. As Unitarian Universalists, we join together on a journey that honors everywhere we've been before. Together, we create a force more powerful than one person or one belief system. Our beliefs are diverse and inclusive. Rather than a creed, we share a covenant based on a set of seven principles, which include the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and the knowledge that we are part of an interconnected web of all existence that calls us to honor the earth and all creatures. So this morning we, work, we welcome both newcomers and those who have been part of our congregation for a long time to this virtual worship service. Thank you for joining us. And now we invite you to hear our call to worship. Alfred S. Cole was a minister, scholar, and librarian of the Universalist Historical Society. In his book, Our Liberal Heritage, he wrote, The time spirit said to John Murray, Go out into the highways and byways of America, your new country. You may possess only a small light, but uncover it, let it shine, use it in order to bring more light and understanding to the hearts and minds of men and women. Give them, not hell, but hope and courage. Do not push them deeper into their theological despair, but preach the kindness and everlasting love of God. We have gathered together today in order to uncover our light let it shine and bring more light, kindness, love, and understanding to others. Come, let us worship together. Celebremos compartiendo nuestras vidas, encendiendo esta Y 
Please join with me in the spirit that some call meditation and others name prayer. Make yourself comfortable. Relax. Take one deep breath and then another. Open your mind. Open your heart. Spirit of life and love, God of many names and mystery beyond all our naming. The year and anxious times continue. We are grateful for the support that has helped us persevere through a difficult week and a difficult year. The election has passed, but questions remain for our country. As we begin to look forward to holidays, however altered, the pandemic surges again, bringing record number, numbers of cases and deaths to our country. We long for connection beyond that through a computer screen. We tentatively go out to see and greet others, maintaining our social distance, donning our masks and PPE. We long for normalcy, but pray for patience and perseverance. We long to physically embrace our friends and family, but give thanks they are there for us to virtually embrace, even in less than ideal ways. We give thanks that we can be there for them. We give thanks we can be there for those whom too many react to with suspicion or even violence. Friday is the Transgender Day of Remembrance. Sadly, 2020 has already seen at least 34 transgender or gender nonconforming people fatally shot or killed by other violent means the majority of which were black and Latinx transgender women. While we celebrate those who are living into their authentic selves and we share our support, hope, and community with them, we mourn for those who have fallen victims to violence for being who they are, and we mourn with their family and friends. We pray in the names of all those known and unknown, present and absent, remembered and forgotten. We pray in the names of all helpers of humankind. May the congregation, absent in body though present in spirit, say amen. We pause now together to lift up that which sits heavy and light on our hearts. Our prayers and good wishes are with Joan Waddell and Peggy Harvey, who are both recovering from surgery. We send our positive energy for quick recoveries. I invite you now to say the name or bring to mind those you wish to be held by the loving embrace of this religious community. They are part of the great cloud of witness and memory, and we will, 
even if we do not know their names, hold them in our hearts. In this great cloud of witness and memory, amid this beloved community, we hear these names and hold them in our hearts. Let us remember the suffering and joy amid and among our community that we do not know. We pause in awe and wonder of the mystery that is life, in the spirit of love, in the spirit of hope, and in the spirit of compassion, I invite each of you to enter into a time of silent prayer, meditation, or reflection. This morning, our offering will be shared with the East Fort Bend Human Needs Ministry. This interfaith alliance serves East Fort Bend County families in need. The ministry runs the local food bank, handing out close to 20,000 boxes of groceries last year. The agency also provides emergency aid to people in temporary crisis situations who might need help covering things like bills for medicine, utilities, or rent. With the COVID pandemic, the Human Needs Ministry has seen a huge increase in the number of people seeking help just to feed themselves or their children. Our regular Sunday morning offering collection invites us to weave a tapestry of love and action. Today, through our shared offering to the East Fort Bend Human Needs Ministry, you are doing just that, providing the necessary threads so that we can demonstrate the love of this community for all of its members through our actions. So I ask you to give generously. An offering now will be gratefully received. reading today is from the Gospel of Inclusion by Carlton Pearson. These are the words of the Reverend Carlton Pearson. He was a bishop in the Pentecostal Church and a member of the megachurch in Tulsa, Oklahoma, until he became a Universalist. Pearson was declared a heretic by his denomination in 2004 and is now an affiliated minister at All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church in Tulsa. Carlton, we are concerned about the comment, the whole world is saved, they just don't know it. We feel this is misleading 
and does not reflect the opinion of the university or scripture. The speaker was one of the most prominent of television pastors in America. With his own television network, millions of faithful followers, and thousands of members in his Texas congregation, I had preached at his church. We both sat on the Board of Regents of Oral Roberts University. His voice was friendly, but his tone was anxious. At the time, I was heavily involved in working to get George W. Bush in the White House for his first term as president. Because of my political commitments, I was unable to meet with a group of board members who wanted to challenge my position on Christian doctrine, a position that, according to them, had shaken the very foundations of the kingdom of God on earth as it were. By the time the phone call ended, it was clear that these friends had made up their minds. I was wrong and dangerous. I knew I would be either forced to change my position or encouraged to resign from the board. It was hard to accept. I was an alumnus of the school. I served on the Board of Regents for over 15 years, and I had been close to the founder and his family for over 30 years. I resigned. I wanted to avoid conflict, but it was also important that I be free to pursue this controversial, exciting new direction in my ministry, even if it meant moving away from some of my respected friends and co-laborers in Christ. As I hung up the phone, I knew I was in for one of the roughest rides of my life as a Christian minister. I knew that I was facing the possibility of losing nearly everything I had built over the last 30 years of my life. My crime? I had rediscovered an ancient truth that would forever change my life and my perspective of God. I had begun to preach the gospel of inclusion. The second reading is from When the Unimaginable Happened by Ann Barker. When the unimaginable happened, the ache that we felt as if love was being lost was the ache of love's despairing truth. This is the love that no one chooses, the loss so out of order, so profound, the love we did not ever want to know. And yet the source of this despair, the reason our hearts cleave and flow is because they know fullness. This is the love of truth and beauty, love that spans the web of being, uniting each of us within its timeless form. When we heard the news, our hearts broke open, spilled into our hands, and there we stared at love, lamenting, what am I to do with this? And with these raw and tender yearnings, we will, beat after precious beat, seek wholeness once again. It will take time to find our balance, to grieve if we make room. Remember, friends, this is the right thing, this ache within our deepest beings. Know that all these things are normal, to feel disrupted, empty, or undone. Our hearts are broken open, and the love that is still true draws us once again together, story by story, step by step, into places of tender knowing, remembering to restore us, mend us, piece by broken piece. This is the love that runs between us, sustaining force of restoration, the love that nourishes and feeds us, binds us each to our collective core. Love will repair us, not the same, but stronger in some places, honoring memories like treasures, living our life's potential in the shadow of the trespass, in the warmth of one another, in the light of what restored we will become.
I'm the Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore. I serve as minister at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock on Long Island in New York. And I thank you and your ministry team for inviting me to speak with you. I'd like to begin by sharing a story. It's one of my favorite stories from our Unitarian Universalist tradition. You may know it well. It's a story I'd love to share. It may be our only Unitarian Universalist miracle story. This is a story of John Murray and Thomas Potter and the beginning of the Universalist Church in America. In 1770, two men met on the ocean shore of New Jersey. They struck a bargain that influences our faith lives today. One of these men, John Murray, had sailed to America heading for a new life. He was a deeply wounded man, having grieved the death of his wife Eliza and their child, having spent a term in debtor's prison, and having been excommunicated from the Methodist Church for preaching universalism. When the ship he was sailing on, the hand in hand, ran aground on a sandbar off New Jersey, John Murray came ashore with a small party looking for provisions and information. The other man who John Murray met was Thomas Potter. Potter was the owner of the land where the hand in hand was stranded. Not long after meeting, Thomas Potter declared to John Murray, you're here to preach at my chapel. Now, 10 years before, in 1760, Thomas Potter had built a small chapel on his property. He had built it of simple wood. There were pews, low pulpit, close to the people was the pew. Potter had opened his chapel to ministers looking for someone who might be the right preacher, someone who might have the right message, something that he could believe in. He had yet to find that minister when he asked Murray to preach. No, 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 was Murray's answer. Murray had suffered so much. He'd lost so much. In England, his preaching had led to his downfall. But you will. You must. God has sent you for this. Thomas Potter was clear and firm. But John Murray was just as clear and firm, no. All right, said Potter. Here is a bargain. If the wind changes and your ship is freed, then go in peace. But if the wind does not change, you will preach in my chapel. Well, the wind did not change. And John Murray preached his first Universalist Sermon in America in Thomas Potter's Chapel. John Murray, with his second wife, Judith Sargent Murray, beside him, went on to found the first Universalist Church in Gloucester, Massachusetts in 1779. They challenged the dominant Calvinist theology of colonial New England. This Calvinist theology championed a God of anger and judgment, a God who would predestine people to hellfire and damnation. In his first sermon in Potter's Chapel, John Murray is said to have preached these words. Go out into the highways and byways. Give the people something of your new vision. You may possess a small light but uncover it, let it shine. Use it in order to bring some light and understanding to the hearts and minds of men and women. Give them not hell, but hope, hope and courage. Preach the kindness and everlasting love of God. In preaching universalism, John Murray joined a theological line that stretched back to the first century where North African Christian theologians like Origen believed that Jesus as Christ had been the last sacrifice to bring about the reconciliation of God and humanity, there would be no eternal damnation. Universalists' beliefs were declared a heresy, along with Unitarianism, in 325 
of the common era. Still, there were both a belief in universal salvation and in the unity of God. This belief would resurface again and again throughout history. And among universalists themselves, there was, of course, a continuing debate about sin and evil and whether people might be made to suffer at least a little bit for their sins before being released from punishment. Yet, at the core of all universalist theology is the belief in a loving God. The American Universalist Church existed as an independent denomination for a little over 180 years, and its spirit now resides here with us in the Unitarian Universalist Association. The universalist ethic of faith, hope, and love stands with the Unitarian tradition of reason, freedom, and tolerance to form the wholeness of our denomination, to form the bedrock on which we build our future. Universalist theology was, at its start, firmly Christian. To the early universalist, God was no doubt a personal God, a Father in heaven, and many of the earliest universalists were also Trinitarians as well. The Christian universalist tradition continues to live in our UU congregations today. It is part of our theological diversity. Our universalism calls us to pluralism, to openness, and remains relevant to us now, no matter where the places of our own responsible search for truth and meaning take us. It has been amazing to follow the story of the Reverend Carlton Pearson, an African-American minister who was a one-time disciple of Oral Roberts, who came to Christian Universalist theology. Reverend Pearson was excommunicated from his church in 2004, just as John Murray was in 1770. Reverend Pearson lost his congregation of several thousand. But after he did a great deal of soul searching, he found the Unitarian Universalist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and came with his remaining members to join that congregation for shelter and community. Reverend Pearson now bases his ministry largely in Chicago, but the Tulsa UU congregation continues to worship and learn with members of Reverend Pearson's church. And Reverend Pearson is an affiliated minister with our Tulsa congregation. Universalism can bring people together. It still leads people to open their hearts. I've heard Reverend Pearson speak about how frightening it was to leave the faith he had known how he was set adrift, losing his role as a leader in his denomination, losing friends and family members, losing status, losing income. But he also talks about what he gained in taking a risk to embrace a faith of love. He speaks of the blessings of having more people in his life, including the liberal religious, the gay, lesbian, transgender people that his old face caused him to condemn. Those he once saw as less than himself are now his friends. He is now free to love and not to judge. John Murray came to America broken, and the miracle for him was to find the support and courage to preach his truth, the truth of a hope-filled faith and the loving spirit of life. And what of Thomas Potter? Thomas Potter was illiterate, but he had inherited a farm. As a landowner, he occupied a place of privilege in his community. He grew prosperous. And you know, some people grow cautious and conservative in their prosperity. Some grow needy of the approval of others, of the need for good standing of status. Community disapproval can lean hard against a person, pushing them to conformity. You can almost hear the neighbors, can't you? Even these hundreds of years removed. What's wrong with Tom? They whisper. Crazy man building that chapel. Who would want to preach there? Isn't our church good enough for him? What's wrong with our preacher? What's wrong with our God? Who does he think he is? But Thomas Potter stood against all that. He stepped into the unknown. He took on the cause of love. 
On hearing of the death of Thomas Potter in 1777, John Murray described him this way. He had unbounded benevolence, was a friend to the stranger, and a feeling, faithful man whose hospitable doors were open to everyone and whose heart was devoted to God. In his will, Thomas Potter left his chapel to John Murray, stipulating that the chapel be open to all who wanted to worship there, regardless of denomination. The early Universalists let go of a religious doctrine present in Calvinism that gave some people a place of privilege above others. That is, some would go to heaven and others would not. Some were important to God, loved by God, and others were not loved, were condemned. I believe that over time, this universalist belief in universal salvation, that all are saved, has come to be understood clearly by us today as all are loved. We must give up our place of privilege, reject the belief that one person or one people are more loved, more entitled than another. For Potter, that meant leaving Calvinism. And for us today, it means a turning away from white supremacy culture. It is not only religion, but science, faith, and fact that confirm our need to take the risk of loving each other. I ask you to see in your mind's eye the famous photo of the planet Earth, serenely blue and green and alone in space. This is our common home, and we need one another to protect our common home and our common humanity. Any religion or social political stance which serves to privilege one people over another will not lead to the ecological repair and equitable distribution of resources that will enable our planet to be healed and our fellow folk from all places on earth to lead lives of peace and prosperity. Thomas Potter was one simple man who lived in the 1770s. He is not considered the Moses of universalism. That was John Murray's legacy. However, we might think of Potter as Aaron to Murray's Moses or Ralph Abernathy to Martin Luther King or John the Baptist to Jesus. There is always the need for a person to lay the groundwork, to proclaim what is to come, to speak up with courage sometimes. That courage comes in moments when the presumed leader falters. It is highly probable that Potter would have suffered to include in his world a place of equity for me as a black woman. His worldview may not have included a place of equity for many of the identities that are now present in any Unitarian Universalist congregation. But he was capable of opening his heart to embrace a God of love. So who knows how wide his circle of love may have expanded. It could have grown large enough to include all of us. Can we find the faithfulness of a Thomas Potter in ourselves? Can we open our hearts wide enough to include ever more people in our circle of concern. Because to love this world, to save this world and its people, we must take the risks of embracing our common destiny, our common link, our common hopes, our shared dreams, the universal mysteries we are confronted with. Our universalist heritage shows us a way to embrace a generative future. Universalism says that with absolute certainty, you are loved, valuable, and of worth. Shine your light in the world. Go out and preach, not hell, but hope. Amen, and blessed be.
we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I offer this benediction. As the Universalists say, may you find love that won't let you down, love that won't let you go, love that won't let you off. Amen. While our church as buildings is closed, our church as people is still meeting, but now online. There are weekly and monthly offerings to keep you connected and engaged with our community. Join us this morning at 11.30 for our new Coffee Half Hour. Grab your favorite mug and log in to interact with new and old friends. The Creative Writing Group meets today at 2. The group welcomes a full range of artistic expression from the traditional to the experimental. During Texts for Troubled Times Tuesday at 5, Reverend Colin continues discussing the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Also, join Reverend Colin's office hours Wednesday at 2 and bring your comments, questions, and thoughts. We're highlighting our two newest online events, the Beginner's Yoga Class Tuesday at 7 and the UU Young Adult Group for those 18 to 25 Friday at 3. More details are on our website. The Healing Racism series continues Wednesday at 5 with a discussion about how to speak up with courage and respect in response to biased or prejudiced remarks, stereotypes, and other hurtful messages. And Saturday at 10.30, using the letters R-A-C-E, reflect, ask about their experiences, connect, and expand. Many of the topics for upcoming discussion groups are on our website, firstuu.org forward slash online hyphen group hyphen meetings. Visit there for more details and to sign up. And remember, all times shown are Central Standard Time.